Yeah, good evening everyone. I am Shivani Tok and I welcome you all to the summary session uh, of this course of Modern Digital Communication Techniques. So basically in this week, uh, the entire course ended in last week itself and as your exams are coming up, so this is an extra, uh, additional summary session that I will be taking up which won't involve uh, solving of uh, problems but it will be some sort of a quick revision of what all concepts were covered in the entire week 12 course. So I'll just uh, quickly go through all the main concepts and main points that were covered in this session and this may give you a little bit idea of how to go ahead and prepare. And uh, like I'll go week by week uh, and have a quick discussion about the content of each week as we proceed. As we, had, as we have proceeded with all the topics, I'll just touch them and uh, we'll try to put some uh, <coughs> uh, emphasis, emphasis on details uh, wherever necessary. Okay, so let's start with the week one. So week one was very introductory. It literally covered all the basic stuff. Now as you will be going ahead and looking uh, and solving it. So let's, let's just go through it also. So this was basically an introductory week. It started by introdu introducing a digital communication system. It started uh, like giving you a difference between an analog and digital communication. Like for analog communication, you had a source, then you had a message. And you were mounting it on a carrier and then you would just transmit it and this process was done in three ways like amplitude modulation frequency modulation and pulse modulation what happens in uh, so this is basically analog what happens in digital is instead of uh, sending this we'll have a digital source that will generate bits or some discrete time dis uh, and discrete amplitude symbols and that would be then mounted uh, uh, or that would be then converted into a waveform that which will be transmitted okay so what exactly happens here is the source that we will be using is digital that is the source will be digital it will have bits or symbols and this digital source is basically or whatever the digital source outputs is basically we have an analog signal we will sample it to get discrete time and then we'll quantize it to get discrete amplitude so that will give me my digital signal and uh, these sources are modeled as random process why because uh, we know the set of symbols that we are transmitting However, we don't know at this particular instant or that particular communication instant what we will be transmitting. Okay. <laughs> then we have the concept of channel. So we know that channel is anything between, uh, entire thing between your transmitter and receiver. We don't know how the channel will behave. And again, we have this noise that gets added up at the receiver end. And the general model for your channel is your additive wide Gaussian noise channel and there are many, sorry, general model for noise is your additive wide Gaussian noise and we had seen various types of channels which we'll discuss as we go ahead. Then an important concept of interface and layering was uh, developed. So what it says is this interface allows uh, a separability between two uh, two major blocks for example if you have this channel encoder here you have this channel encoder and decoder here and you have source encoder and decoder here now if i know what input this channel encoder takes then i can independently design these two blocks by ignoring all the details of this source encoder and source decoder Sorry. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so this is an interface. And in digital communication, we have a digital interface that basically separates your source encoder and channel encoder. And this uh, this gives you cheap uh, digital hardware and other thing and other uh, things. 
then the other concept is uh, like layering so what you do is here you break uh, these logical blocks and study them independently for example this uh, channel encoder sorry this source encoder is then divided into three parts the first one was sampling then quantizer and then encoding encoder these three parts it can be further divided into small small parts which you can study independently so that helps in understanding the working of each of this block in a greater detail <coughs> after looking at this just a little bit idea of information theory was given and it is a it can be considered as an entirely different uh, aspect or entirely different stream of research and uh, other works because there are heavy works going on in this area also so what it says is we can view all the communication systems as binary sequences through binary sequences and we need to design a source that will give you binary sequences to form a sequence that binary sequence should be suitable for your channel that is your channel should be able to handle that binary sequence and shouldn't be able to convert it to something very random signal it should be in some controlled way after that we have the source coding then the we actually started with source coding so this uh, in this block diagram you can see that the first block after source is the source encoder so what it, this source encoding does is <coughs> after your sampling and quantizer in this source encoder we had three blocks so uh, this last block was source encoding so we have <coughs> we basically have uh, <coughs> an input to it and what we need to get is a code word and what we aim is we want a minimum length code word to a particular input or minimum average length code word and it uses the probabilistic nature so this was just a very basic idea of source coding that was introduced so now let us go ahead to further and look uh, what was covered in week two so this week two started with the block diagram of the receiver so i won't go into much detail of this but yeah yes we had looked now if we go back and see we have actually looked at this part this part then we had seen this channel estimation channel equalization also we had seen this source encoder also we have seen the sampler and a to d conversion these things local oscillators is for demodulation purpose and these things we have seen in a much greater detail so yeah these things we had seen now other things like this packet detection chan, uh, this access combiner these all things we didn't see in a much greater detail but yeah these are some of the things that we had seen now as i mentioned earlier we uh, the first thing that we started was the source encoding so what happens in a source encoder is uh, after quantizing after quantizer you are getting some symbols okay these symbols have to be mapped to some codes or code words and this operation is done by this uh, source encoder and an aim is to give the minimum possible average code length to code word length to the uh, source output <coughs> so what we have here is we have these discrete sources so this discrete source basically gives you a sequence of symbols which we can collect in a set which we call as alphabet and this alphabet is finite sized now another thing important is this receiver knows what your alphabet is it just doesn't know what exactly is being transmitted at the current instant from this given set so this, this alphabet is shared with your uh, receiver also now this source encoding can be done in two ways one is fixed length coding and another is, another is various variable length encoding so this fixed length uh, coding is really a simple thing so what it says is we have a code that will map each and every symbol or each and every letter in this alphabet to a distinct code word <coughs> of binary digits like this for example if this x has let's say four symbols then we'll have we'll need four code words 
and for that we'll require four code words and that will be represented by bits of length 2 because 2 to the power 2 is 4 so then what we have is if l is the code word length like each code word if it is having l length then the maximum number of distinct code words that you can get binary code words that you can get is 2 to the power l then if this code word is uh, having m code this code is having m code words then this l this l should lie between log m to the base 2 plus 1 and log m to the base 2 this should be satisfied that is the code word length should satisfy something like this or equivalently we can say that this l the code word length should be seal function of log m to the base 2 now this was a fixed length coding simple thing now if we see here uh, this this interval might be huge at some a some cases and again the optimal thing is to achieve this lower bound because we want lower uh, lower average code words so we want uh, this l to approach this log m to the base 2 however it can either take this value log m or the value log m to the base 2 by this formula now in order to get uh, into a better situation what we do is we consider a block of n symbols now after considering that this l bar this l bar is basically length of this code word per each alphabet and that now lies between log m to the base 2 and log m to the base 2 plus 1 by n so as my n tends to infinity that is for large n this l bar will tend to log m to the base 2 and again an important uh, thing to note here is in this fixed length coding there is no probabilistic assumption taken into consideration it is just like uh, you have four code words and give uh, four uh, alphabets give four code words to it don't see what probability it has and other things so so this might give you some issues so in order uh, and might give you average code word length which is unnecessarily too high so instead of going for a fixed code word length what we go is we go for variable length coding so uh, the motivation for variable length coding is that some symbols might occur more frequently some symbols will occur more frequently compared to others and uh, if a symbol is occurring more frequently we can give it a shorter code word length similarly if a symbol is occurring less frequently we can assign it a longer code word so based on that we will go and develop a this is just an intuition or motivation for developing variable length code so based on that we'll go ahead and see how to do that now uh, the definition of a variable length coding is this code c maps a symbol every symbol in x to a distinct code word of binary digits of length lx and this lx is the length and yeah it is a variable length and it is like a <coughs> it will be a random variable okay an important concept in this variable length coding is uniform decodability that is when you are sending a stream of bits it should be uniformly decodable what it says is if i have x1 x2 and xm and x1 hat x2 hat and xm hat and i take the code words corresponding to these now if I uh, send this and this like these two sh shouldn't be same like let us try to understand this with the help of an example so let's say I have a code word with c1 as 0 c2 as 1 and c3 as 10 okay <laughs> so now suppose I send uh, c2 c1 and 0 so uh, sorry c2 c1 and c3 so the binary bit stream that is that the receiver will see will be basically 1010 now so suppose i send c3 c2 c1 so again i will receive 1010 now the receiver doesn't see a demarcation between the symbols it will just receive a bit stream so now it will be very difficult to distinguish between whether c2 c1 c3 was transmitted or c3 c2 c1 was transmitted so this kind of thing uh, brings 
uh, ambiguity and this uh, is like you can't decode it uniformly or you can't say with surety that this is the particular code word which I have transmitting so in order to avoid this what we should have is no sequence of uh, alphabets no two sequence of alphabets should give me a same bit stream and that sig uh, signifies your uniform decodability so while developing a variable length code we need to take into consideration this uniform decodability as well as more this thing that uh, more frequently occurring symbols should be assigned less bits uh, or a smaller code word and one way to do is is to go for prefix free codes so this prefix free codes will give me a uniform decodability as uh, by the nature of it okay so this prefix free <laughs> so what do you in this prefix free code what do you mean by a prefix so if i have a string let's say 101011 so then uh, this thing will be prefix of uh, this entire thing similarly this thing also 1010 will also be a prefix of that sequence 1011 will also be a prefix of the sequence and this 101011 will also be the prefix of the sequence so any substring that appears before the particular string will be known as a prefix so now if i'm developing a code word then a binary code word then if no code word is prefix of uh, any other code word then such codes are known as prefix free codes and the best way to see a prefix free code is by using a binary tree and it says that every leaf of that binary tree can correspond to a prefix free code no nodes will correspond to a prefix free code like if a code word lies at the node then it won't be a prefix free code for example if this is the tree i am having then these three can be a code word however if i have a code word here then this will be a prefix so this can't be a code word This is given by your prefix free condition so your code words will reside at your leads and not at your uh, intermediate nodes okay <coughs> the next concept is of this uh, full prefix free code so what it says is so suppose i have been given a tree which is let's say something like this now if i look here then i can clearly see that i can add a leaf here so this black one or okay or i can either add a leaf here or i can just remove this so this is possible that i can add or remove a leaf from this and still i will be able to conserve the prefix free property so this thing in such a situation this is not a full tree now suppose i consider this okay now if I consider this then if I remove this leaf and put uh, it here then it will destroy my prefix free property similarly if I add a node here and put a add a, extend this node extend this leaf to add another leaf and add a code word here then again this will be a prefix of this which means that this black one is again uh, so it means that we can't add or remove any leaf uh, by without destroying the prefix free property which means that this black one here is full tree and this is not a full tree so this is the concept of full tree now suppose i have been given an alphabet and i have been said i have been said that okay now you design a prefix free code which have a particular length like each and every code word has a particular length so now we should know that whether such a prefix free code can be generated or not 
so that is given by Crafts inequality so it says that every prefix free code for an alphabet let's say given by this and each of its code word has length L of AJ where J is in this set it will say if it satisfies or if and only if it satisfies summation L uh, summation okay, this should be J summation j equal to 1 to capital m to the power minus l length of a j less than or equal to 1 then and only then it will we can construct a prefix free code this is given by your crafts inequality so this crafts inequality says just says that we can construct a prefix free code with given lengths it does not give you the design aspect of uh, or it doesn't tell you how to design that prefix free code that you should keep in mind so if you just check the crafts inequality and yeah it's less than or equal to one then you can't say that it is a prefix free code you'll have to see how the code is being generated for example if you are given one zero one zero sorry like this if you have been given this code word Now, if you observe carefully, this is prefix of uh, this code word. However, this this thing, the lens that is 1, 2 and 2 satisfies crafts, crafts inequality because 2 to the power minus 1 plus 2 to the power minus 2 plus 2 to the power minus 2 is half plus 1 by 4 plus 1 by 4 which is equal to 1. So, it satisfies the crafts inequality but it is not a prefix free code. This is not a prefix free code. However, in similar way, if I consider this as 1, 0, 0 and 0, 1, this will be a prefix free code. And this will also satisfy your crafts inequality. So now if you have been given to see whether this is a prefix free code or not, you and if you just uh, look at your crafts inequality and then see if it is prefix free uh, tree or not, then uh, you may land up in such a situation where it is actually not but still it satisfies the crafts inequality so you just keep a watch on uh, how you are going to handle such kind of questions and this 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 equation one is satisfied with uh, equality when the tree is full so that thing also you should keep in mind <coughs> after that we looked at the concept of discrete memoryless source so in discrete memoryless source uh, what does it say is uh, it is a source uh, that generates a semi infinite uh, sequence of source letters that belongs to a finite force, uh, source alphabet so it will generate x1 x2 and so on and each of this xi will be coming from this source alphabet that each of this xi will be either belonging to this a1 uh, a2 or am <clears throat> any one of that value and uh, this is a discrete memory less source and each of this x will have a probability distribution which is characterized by the probability mass function it is a discrete random variable so it will be characterized by a probability mass function which is given by the set px of a1 till px of am where this where this px of a1 is basically the probability that your x takes value a another thing that you should take in mind is this is a memoryless source and that's why x1 x2 and so on are independently distributed as well as those are identically distributed <coughs> and uh, x1 x2 and so on uh, <coughs> yeah <coughs> okay now let's say x is a code word which is con generated by this source that is from x1 x2 and so on and this x is having uh, the code word which corresponds to uh, this s ha x has a length l then this l is a random variable that represents the code word length and uh, in that fashion your average code word length is given by l bar which is summation j equal to 1 to m l of aj into px of aj okay like this 
each of this event <coughs> we have <coughs> can be <coughs> this x can belong to a1 or so on so your average one <coughs> You'll represent each of this x with some code word and the code word length will be at uh, the average code word length will be given by this formula here so what is happening is this x1 x2 and so on is the source is coming from a finite source so these are your source alphabets or uh, take a value from your source alphabet each of this xi will have to be given to your source encoder the source encoder will generate a code word this code word will have length L of X and this L of X will take the value L of AJ with probability P of AJ and that's why when you're averaging you will have to average over all possible values of M uh, all possible values of J from 1 to capital N and that way you will get your expected length so this is the expected length of your source so when we are doing a variable length coding then uh, what we want is the average minimum number of bits and that is given by hx which is your entropy and this hx is given by the formula summation <laughs> So suppose this x belongs to a1 till a m and each of this a's take values as pj this is probability x aj so this is summation j equal to 1 to capital m pj into log of 1 by pj so this is the equation of your entropy then the minimum average length minimum average uh, code word length will lie in the interval hx to hx plus 1 now suppose we have two random variables that is f, uh, that is y and x and if these two random variables are independent then in that situation we have h of x comma y that is uh, this is the joint entropy of x and y so hx y will be equal to hx plus hy in general it is hx plus h of x given y um, sorry hx plus h of y given x but now since y and x are independent h of y given x is equal to h of y that's why your h of x given y is given by h of x plus h of y so by using this given identity we went and see the fixed to variable length coding <coughs> so in this what we do we collect n number of source symbols that are coming up and then after grouping them we do source variable length coding for that particular group and that thing that particular n length group of your uh, symbols and if we do that then this average length of your code word per exact uh, per exact source code word letter is lies in the interval hx to h of, h of x plus 1 by n and as your n tends to infinity this l bar min by n will be basically tending to h of x which is the minimum possible thing that you can achieve the only drawback in this situation is this n has to be very long which may not be the case every time now an important thing here is uh, in order to do your variable length coding there are several approaches that you can do and one approach is your Huffman coding so if you are <coughs> so in Huffman coding what you will do you will go and uh, collect your minimum <coughs> you will uh, arrange your probabilities in decreasing order and then combine the least probabilities at every step and then form your code word and your second thing is uh, you can use this formula to get the length of aj and then use your binary tree 
to get <coughs> the optimal code word which you are having. Okay. Yeah. And this Huffman coding is optimal. It gives you a full tree and you can't get a better uh, average code word length. It will be more closer to your H of X compared to other cases. Okay. So this was the source encoder. Now um, source coding block. Now we had seen that this source encoder comprises of your sampler, quantizer and uh, source coding. Now whatever we have done was after looking at your quantizer. So before that there are two blocks. One is sampling and quantizer, quantization. So let us look at these blocks one by one. So the first thing uh, that we saw was this sampling. So in sampling what we do is, suppose I have an analog signal that is XA of T. <coughs> So I have an analog signal. Let's say it looks something like this. Yeah, this is your x a of t. So what we do is we dis uh, we consider or we construct a signal x n or sequence x n, which is x a of n t. That is at every t duration. That is this is zero. This is t. This is two t. This is three t, and so on. So at every t duration will take this value and so on so this thing here it will be x of 1 this one will be x of 0 this thing will be x of 2 and this thing will be x of 3 so this this x0 x1 x2 and so on will give you your sample signal or se sequence which corresponds to your sampled sequence now this interval from 0 to t or this duration of t is known as your sampling duration and your fs which is inverse of t which is uh, 1 by t is given by your sampling frequency now uh, how to select your sampling frequency is given by the Nyquist sampling theorem so it says that uh, if I have a band limited signal or let's say if the highest frequency contained in any analog signal xa of t is f max equal to b that is the maximum signal that you are having is f max then if I sample my signal with a sampling frequency greater than or equal to 2 f max which is equal to 2b then I can reconstruct back uh, the analog signal xa t I can recover it back from your sample sequence by using the interpolation function gt equal to sine 2 pi bt upon 2 pi bt. So that you can do by considering this as a filter. So your xa of t will be basically convolution between this gt and the sequence of this which is given by the formula summation n equal to minus infinity to infinity xa of n by fs gt minus nfs n by fs. So this is the way how you will con uh, reconstruct. Now just a side note, you can just go and look at uh, some signals and system course or some other courses which are related to this sampling, which has a greater depth of this sampling and other stuff. Then after looking at sampler, so again I'll reiterate the same thing. We saw this sampling. This we have seen. Then we had this quantization. This we haven't seen yet. And after that, we have your source encoding. The source encoding we have seen. And then here you get your bits, which go to your channel encoder. <laughs> okay. So this sampling we have seen, the source encoding we have seen. So the only thing which is left in this particular block is your quantization. Now, what this quantization do is, this is giving me a sequence xn. Your sampling is giving me, giving you as a signal, a sequence xn. So this quantization will give me xq of n, again a sequence. However, this sequence will have a finite precision. For example, this this sampled signal will be something like this. Like this we have, suppose this is your sample signal, 
now what this quantizer will do this will just allow you to take these values only these values it can't take other values so what will happen is you till this point you will take this value then you will go here and take this value then you will take this value then you will take this value and so on so you will take only the values in finite procedure okay and that process is known as quantization so what it says is discrete time continuous amplitude signals are converted to your finite precision then your xq of n is basically your quantizer output which is given by this q of xn and then the quantization error uh, is eq of n which is xq minus xn now this mean squared error this mean squared error uh, basically is distributed uniformly between your uh, minus delta by 2 to delta by 2 so how this is done is let's say let's say this is your some level 1 let's say l1 and this is your another quantization level l or okay this <coughs> these are two boundaries not quantization levels these are two boundaries and this is your threshold or let's say I'll just do it in this way say this is some m1 and m2 and what happens is then you will have another thing here now if I receive a signal here this range will be my delta now if I receive a signal here then I'll go here if I receive a signal here then I'll go here so basically this is some sort of a threshold so if I'm having it greater than this, then I'll go above. And if I get greater than this, then I'll go below. Now the problem is ha will happen only when I'm here. So the quantization error will be either delta by 2 or it will be minus delta by 2. And any value between the these two can be taken with equal probability. So that's why your quantization error will be uniformly distributed between minus delta by 2 to delta by 2. Now after looking at this quantization, uh, we went on to look at some signals and systems concepts like characterization of signals which included your uh, deterministic, finite energy and those kind of things and after that we looked at uh, <coughs> yeah and after that we looked at we looked at your unit impulse and unit step. So your unit step is basically ut, which is equal to 1 for t greater than 0 and 0 for t less than 0. And your unit impulse can be given by d dt of ut and its area under the curve is equal to 1. That is integral delta t or minus infinity to infinity dt is equal to 1. So this we had seen. After that, we saw the Fourier transform and some of its properties. So your Fourier Fourier transform, we had your synthesis and analysis equations. So we saw that uh, if xt we have, then its Fourier transform is given by, or rather, this xt can be constructed from its Fourier transform from minus in uh, by this formula, which is one over two pi, integral from minus infinity to infinity x of omega into e power j omega dt this is uh, when the case uh, where omega is <coughs> the angular frequency now if we consider uh, your hertz frequency then it will be integral minus infinity to infinity x of f e power <coughs> e power j 2 pi f t dt <coughs> so this is your synthesis equations So if we look at analysis equations, so, so that will be xt, sorry, x of f is equal to integral minus infinity to infinity, xt e power minus j 2 pi f t dt, this is t omega and this is t f, sorry, <coughs> and your x of omega will be integral minus infinity to infinity, xt e power 
माइनस जे ओमेगा टी डिग्री दीज आर माई एनालिसिस इक्वेशन After that, we looked at the Hilbert transform. So, for Hilbert transform, the impulse response H T is one upon pi T, and its frequency domain or its Fourier transform is basically minus J sine function of F. So, this looks something like this. And this is your H of F. For your Hilbert transform. <coughs> After looking at these basic concepts, the important concept that we looked at was your equivalent low pass signal, uh, low pass equivalent or complex baseband signal representation of your systems and signals. So, in order to do that, what we do is suppose I have been given a signal ST and the signal is band pass. So if the signal is band pass, uh, it's and it is real, let's say. So it will have a Fourier transform which is something like this. Just draw a triangle for symmetricity. Yeah. So if it is a real signal, then uh, this these two will be very same. Like it it satisfies conjugate symmetric property. So instead of transmitting these to both what we can do is we can just concentrate on this or analyze this part by taking it to your uh, baseband this is a band pass signal so we can just take this to your baseband and then analyze it so it will just require uh, less processing also this kind of processing like after demodulation you are getting back to your lower frequency regime so that helps a lot and it's easy to understand also now if we are doing that then We'll have to understand how your channel behaves in equivalent low pass. Your, uh, <coughs> or in other words, how a system behaves in an equivalent low pass. How to represent a system input and system output in its equivalent low pass. Also, if I have a random process, that also I should see how it will behave in. And if it is a band pass, I should see how it behaves in a equivalent low pass case. So for that, this ST, if it is a band pass, I can represent it <coughs> as, I can represent this ST as real part of SLT e power j 2 pi FCT or AT plus cos 2 pi FCT plus theta T and, okay, okay, <coughs> where this SLT this SLT is XT plus J times YT. This SLT is the low pass equivalent. Of ST. Which I can also write as. AT into E power J theta T. So this AT. Will be under root of X square T. Plus Y square T. And this theta T will be tan inverse of y t upon x t. Okay. Now, along with this definition, I can also write this s t as x t cos 2 pi f c t plus y t sin 2 pi f c t and this. And the Fourier transform that is s f t, uh, sorry, s f, that is Fourier transform of this baseband signal, uh, sorry, of this band pass signal is related to its low pass equivalent by the formula SLF minus FC plus SL conjugate minus F minus FC by 2. So this is the Fourier transform relation between the Fourier transform of SF and Fourier transform SL of F of uh, your equivalent low pass signal. In similar way, <coughs> the system, any uh, no, LTI system is characterized by its impulse response and we can make use of the convolution operation. So this equivalent low pass system is uh, will be related to the the Fourier transform of your equivalent low pass systems will be related to the Fourier transform of your impulse response of your band pass uh, system representation by this formula here that is H F equal to H L F minus F C plus H L conjugate minus F minus F C. Now, once we know that we have, <coughs> so what exactly is happening here is we have an input which is SF uh, or rather ST. Then we have this HT which is my system. 
and then we have an output RT. Now I have to get a low pass equivalent of this. So what I need is this SLT which will get into HL of T and it should output me RL of T. So if we do that, that can be done by considering the low pass equivalent representations of the in frequency domain. So this Fourier transform of RF is equal to half of HL F minus FC SL F minus FC multiplied um, added with these two so this I can consider as RL of F this I can consider as RL of F minus FC and this I can consider as RL of F plus FC which means that my RL of F is equal to SL of F into HL of F therefore this RL of T that is equivalent to low pass representation of your system uh, output is basically low pass equivalent signal convolved with low pass equivalent system that comes from the Fourier transform property that convolution in time domain is multiplication in frequency domain. After looking at these, the next thing that we saw was uh, representation of band pass stationary process using equivalent low pass. So first thing is we have this wide sense stationary process. So in wide sense stationary process, the second moments and the first moments so up to second moments there is no dependence on time it just depends on here time delay so suppose uh, we have a, a random process which is nt so we can represent it as real part of zt into e power j 2 pi fct which is equal to xt cos 2 pi fct minus yt sin 2 pi fct in the same way where this zt is xt plus j times yt so this is simply your low pass equivalent representation of nt which is your noise term Now, if this NT, that is if this uh, random process NT is wide sense stationary, then we have these inequalities where this phi xx of tau will be equal to phi yy of tau and phi xy of tau will be equal to minus phi phi x of tau. So what are these quantities? So your phi xx of tau is equal to expectation of xt into x of t plus tau then your phi y y of tau is expectation of y t into y t plus tau then your phi x y <coughs> your phi x y of tau is equal to expectation of yt into x of t plus tau and phi y x of tau is equal to expectation of x star xt into y of t plus tau okay so then if it is a wide sense stationary process then we have this equalities here and this phi nn of tau will be equal to phi zz of real part of phi zz of tau into e power j 2 pi fct where this phi zz of tau will be equal to phi xx of tau plus j times phi yx of tau. Now if we consider a white noise then it is stationary process and its PSD is flat that is the autocorrelation function that is phi nn of tau for this will be n naught by 2 delta tau which means that its phi xx of f will be equal to n naught by 2 for all f so this is your white noise process and the equivalent band base band representation of this process is given by this formula phi zz of tau equal to n naught sin pi bt upon b pi bt so this is basically a sync function after looking at these, the next things that we need to do were related to your modulation schemes and rather we are going uh, ahead with your transmitter end, like how you will play modulator and other things. So in order to understand that, the two major concepts that we should know are the vectors and signal spaces.
So these vector spaces are basically collection of vectors which satisfy certain properties and signal spaces in similar way is a space of signals where which will satisfy some particular set of properties. We won't go into details of those properties. However, we'll just look at some of the operations and some of the properties that these vector spaces can have or the vectors in this vector spaces can have. So the first one is this uh, inner product. So let's say V1 and V2 are two vectors. So this V1 and V2 are two vectors and the dot product between these two, we can also write it as V1, V2. So this is basically summation I equal to one to capital N, V1 I into V2 I. Now, if it is a complex vector, then we can just put a conjugate sign here okay now <coughs> orthogonal vectors so if we have orthogonal vectors then v1 dot v2 will be equal to 0 or let's say vi comma vj will be equal to 0 for all i not equal to j and if it is orthonormal then vi dot vj will be equal to 1 if i equal to j and equal to 0 if i not equal to j then we have this triangular inequality that is if we have this norm of v1 plus norm of v2 then this will be <coughs> <coughs> less than or equal to norm of v1 plus norm of v2 this we have then we have this Gram Schmidt procedure. So, this Gram Schmidt procedure basically helps you to develop orthogonal or rather orthonormal vectors from a given set of vectors. So, if you have v1, v2, v3, and so on, some m vectors, then you can represent them all of them using less than m, less than or equal to m number of vectors which are orthogonal. So, this is a procedure uh, which is used for generating a, a basis or rather a set of orthonormal vectors that will solve uh, that will span the entire vector space vector space which was under consideration now similar to the signal space uh, similar to the vector space we have the concept of vector space so for that if we have two vector signals that is x1t and x2t the inner product of these two signals is given by integral from minus infinity to infinity x1t into x2 T, D, T, and if it is a complex you can just put a conjugate sign here then uh, again we have the same concept of orthogonal and orthonormal vectors so if x1 t and x2 t is equal to 0 then they are orthogonal and along with that if norm x1 t equal to norm x2 t equal to 1 then these two are orthonormal also Similar to this, we'll have your triangular inequality and we'll have the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality also. So this Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is nothing but your V1 comma V2 is less than or equal to norm V1 into norm V2. And similar thing will hold uh, in signal space also and this holds with equality if V1 is some C times V2. And along, similar to your vector space, uh, we had the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, uh, sorry, your Gram-Schmidt procedure here. The same way, we'll have the Gram-Schmidt procedure for your vector, uh, for your signal space also. Now, I'll encourage you to look at uh, the week 5 uh, tutorial. We have taken good number of examples for uh, this Gram-Schmidt procedure. It will be a good exercise to just go back and look at those examples and understand those before going for your exams. So after that, okay. So after that, uh, the concept that we had seen was this modulator, the digital modulator. So what this digital modulator does is, so we have this modulator. <coughs> so this modulator basically has input as bit streams. And then it will generate some signal which is SMT. Okay, now this SMT, <coughs> <coughs> so 
so what it does is so we have this bit stream so it will group it group these bit streams into groups uh, or group these bits into the length key groups and each of these will be assigned one waveform let's say x1t x2t now again it is and xt3 and so on and this mapping from this group of bits to a particular waveform is done by this modulator so what it help what it does it does is it maps k bits to one b waveform so the number of distinct waveforms that you will need will be equal to m equal to 2 to the power k because we are having bits here and these are the number of possible distinct waveforms which we are having and these waveforms are transmitted over a fixed duration of time now there are various modulation schemes like uh, there are various ways in which we can map to this group of bits to the uh, waveforms and these can be classified based on memory for example either it was it would be a memoryless uh, system or with memory so if it is with memory then whatever waveform i am assigning to this group will not depend on whatever was transmitted previous to that this x2 won't depend on what i had transmitted earlier and um, if it was with memory then there will be some pass dependency in deciding the waveform which is here now another thing uh, is the classification based on linearity so this is the same superposition theorem or super procedure superposition principle that we use for <coughs> developing uh, for any kind of signal super simple superposition theorem now there are various modulation schemes which we'll be looking at and majorly we looked at pulse amplitude modulation and uh, fre uh, frequency shift keying and phase shift keying so first we started looking at the very simple modulation technique which is pulse amplitude modulation which is smt equal to real part of amgt 2 pi fct so let us look at it in greater detail so this pulse amplitude modulation we have this smt equal to real part of amgt e power j 2 pi fct where this m varies from 1 to capital m and this t belongs to 0 to t where this capital t is given by symbol duration now this symbol duration should be equal to k times tb where this tb is bit duration so what do you mean by bit duration so let's say my k is equal to 3 and let's say i have received 101 now the, the source encoder which is giving you these bit streams will take some tb duration to generate each of this bit this much duration this tb duration it will take to generate one bit so the total time to generate this entire bit stream is basically three times tb and this should be exactly equal to your ts or rather t which is your symbol duration now for pulse amplitude modulation this am now you can clearly see the information is contained in the amplitude of whatever you are transmitting so this am is given by 2m minus 1 minus md where this t is the minimum distance uh, between the adjacent amplitudes so if my k uh, if my capital m is uh, 4 then let's say this is 0 then the values that i'll have is this t 3d minus t and minus 3d yeah this will be the four uh, levels that i'll have and <coughs> this smt i can write as sm into ft where this sm equal to under root eg by 2 am and if this uh, this ft is under root 2 uh, by eg gt cos 2 pi fct so this ft is the orthogonal basis the only uh, one basis that i can use to represent this entire signal and since it requires only one basis this constellation is one dimensional the energy of it of this constellation is given or let's say mth uh, signal of this constellation is given by half am square eg and uh, the euclidean distance between any two points is given by the formula d times under root 2 eg m minus n and the minimum Euclidean distance is given by t times under root 2 eg. Now you have these four amplitude levels and now you need to uh, <coughs> or four waveforms and you have four options 
to assign the waveforms that is 0 0 should can be assigned to any one of these then 0 1 can be assigned to remaining one of the three and so on okay so how to do that so that is given by your gray coding so let me just copy use the same diagram here okay so now suppose i assign uh, it something like this and uh, we had seen in decision rules that we'll have some decision thresholds let's say these are the decision thresholds and we know that we'll have some noise so now if i had transmitted this this point sorry if i transmitted this point and by some noise it gets uh, converted here so uh, your zero one is being detected as one zero but now what is happening is this 0 is getting converted to 1 and this 1 is getting converted to 0 which means that for one symbol error I am getting 2 bit errors now if instead of doing that if I transmit if I assign it in this way that is 0 0 0 1 1 1 and 1 0 so again if I have transmitted this and I have received this you can see that this 0 gets converted to 1 but this 1 still remains 1 which means I will have a 1 bit error so in order to reduce bit errors what we can do is we can use gray coding and what gray coding says that this adjacent things uh, when we are assigning symbols what we'll do is we'll just change one bit with your adjacent <coughs> uh, in, in your adjacent waveforms that if i am sending zero zero then in minus d it will just change by one bit let's say zero one then in uh, when i am having d then i'll send one one if i'm having 3d then i'll send one zero like that only one bit change i will be doing this can be achieved by doing a gray coding okay <coughs> and this gray coding will be used in every modulation scheme that we will be looking at Okay, after looking at uh, this uh, pulse amplitude modulation, the next modulation scheme that we looked at was this phase shift king. So, uh, now in phase shift king, the information that is available will reside in the phase of the signal that I am transmitting. So, the information lies here in theta m, where this theta m depends on your m and is given by 2 pi by m into uh, 2 pi by capital M into small m minus 1. So, this is how you will construct your theta m. This thing I can also write as gt times cos 2 pi fct plus theta m. So again, this is your phase component that is coming up. And this thing I can also write as gt cos theta m cos 2 pi fct minus gt sin theta m plus sin 2 pi fct. This I can represent as sm f1t plus sm2 f2t. Where this sm1 is given by under root eg by 2 cos theta m. And sm2 is given by under root eg by 2 sin theta m. And f1t is given by this factor which is the cosine uh, component of your carrier cosine carrier and uh, f2t is here sinusoidal or sine carrier okay so now you can observe that this smt is the entire signal and that requires f1t and f2t two orthonormal bases which are listed here now since it requires two orthonormal bases this is a two-dimensional constellation And uh, this constellation lies on a circle and the circle has a radius of under root eg and uh, all the constellation points lie something like this. So this is basically your 8 PSK or 8 Ari PSK. All the constellation points will lie on the circle of radius under root G. Okay. Sorry, under root EG by 2. Not under root EG. Under root EG by 2. Let me do very precise under root eg by 2 this 2 is also under root under the square root so the energy of this signal is eg by 2 
and the minimum Euclidean distance that is the distance between these two points is given by under root eg 1 minus cos of m minus n m by pi and this is the minimum Euclidean distance between the uh, sorry this is the Euclidean distance between the two points and if I need to <coughs> if I need to go for the minimum Euclidean distance this m minus n will be equal to 1 so your minimum Euclidean distance will be under root eg 1 minus cos pi by m which I can write as 1 upon eg 2 times sine square pi by 2m which is equal to sine of pi by 2m multiplied by under root 2eg so this is your minimum Euclidean distance for this particular constellation okay after that the next constellation scheme that we had seen was quadrature amplitude modulation so in this what happens is in this you have you can <coughs> you have your information placed in amplitude as well as phase so you can write it as amc gt cos 2 pi fct minus ams gt sin 2 pi fct so this you can um, see as pulse amplitude modulations two pulse amplitude modulations on orthonormal basis two different uh, let's say i and q components or we can write the same thing as am plus j ams gt into e power 2 pi fct which i can write as vm e power j theta m <coughs> into e power j 2 pi fct so now i have an information in the amplitude as well as in phase so now i can consider this as a psk and pam so this component will give me a pulse amplitude modulation this will give me a phase uh, shift king so P, uh, pulse amplitude modula modulation and plus pam or i can view it as pulse amplitude modulation on both i and q component okay Another the thing is <coughs> we have the square and rectangular quam. So in this square and rectangular quam, uh, the most important so if uh, your square and so this can be constructed by using pulse amplitude on both I and Q. So it will be something like this. Just some arbitrary constellation I'm draw drawing. It's not according to the scheme. Yeah, so this is some square or rectangular quam. Now what happens, it is very easy to scale. So if I need to add, uh, uh, let's say, more points, let's say I can just go and adding it. Something like this. Without disturbing the existing constellation. So when I have to choose between two constellations, uh, which is generally done in this new system communication generation so whenever i have to do it uh, like choose between 16 quam or 32 quam so i can easily scale them up without having much effort without putting on much effort so for this particular quam constellation any quam constellation i can write smt as sm1 plus f20 plus sm2 plus f2t so this sm1 is under root eg by 2 amc and SM2 is under root EG by 2 AMS and f one t is and F2T is the same basis that we had seen for, my, for the PSK system. So again I need two bases to represent the quam signal and that's why this is also a two dimensional constellation. Okay. So these were the major constellations that we had seen and after looking at these the next thing that we saw was uh, multidimensional signals. So what happens in this multidimensional signal is, <coughs> so suppose this is, uh, so suppose this is let's say a time axis or frequency axis, then what I can do is I can just have this divided into slots like this orthogonal slots and I can send one signal like this or one I have a I can have one basis like this 
another basis like these and so on so these two are orthogonal and i can construct like this all i so these will give me time frequency thing and again this will be <coughs> what do we say these will be orthogonal in time or orthogonal in frequency so these will give me multi-dimensional signals so if i have m such waveforms the dimension of it will be capital m now this i can extend further so what i can do is i can have time here and frequency here and then i can grid it like this so i can have an orthogonal frequency and time thing so each i can construct signal waveforms which are ortho which lie in this interval so this block and this block will be orthogonal in time and frequency both so this will give me let's say i have m here and n here m by m into n orthogonal signals so this is my generating this is one these are the ways of generating multi-dimensional signals and the specific way which we had looked at was this frequency shift key orthogonal frequency shift key and for that my smt is given by under root 2 e by 2 e by et cos 2 pi fct plus 2 pi m delta f where this then i can write this m delta fc plus m delta f as fm plus m delta f so this thing smt i can write as under root 2 e by t cos of 2 pi fm t the another thing that we saw was the correlation coefficient between these two signals which is given by the formula rho k m sin pi t m minus k delta f pi t m minus k delta f into e power j t m minus k delta f now uh, okay <coughs> now when we had uh, split this into orthogonal parts in each of them i can do a modulation which is based on some 1d constellation or 2d constellations like quam so if I am modulating it with a 1D signal, then I can have this delta F as 1 by 2T. And if I am modulating it with a 2D signal, then I can have it as 1 by T in order to get orthogonal signals. Another way of doing uh, these things are going for FDM or OFDM, which are not discussed in, the, uh, in this course, but are just mentioned that these are few techniques which can be used. So all the modulation techniques that were discussed previous or prior to these were uh, memoryless. Next we went on to look at uh, modulation schemes with memory. So just for motivation, first of all we looked at this NRZ. So for this NRZ what we do is we give if I have plus 1 then I will modulate it as some plus V volts. And if it is 0 then I modulate it as minus V volts. However in this NRZI in this NRZI what we do is we'll do a 180 degree phase shift if we see a 1 and this thing helps in clock synchronization a lot because if I am receiving a constant 1111 it will be very difficult to see whether my time slot is see, uh, changing here or my time slot is changing let's say here it will be very difficult however if i am getting something like this then it is very clear that this is my t again this will be my t and this will be my t so this helps in improving my clock synchronization another way of doing modulation schemes with memory is this continuous phase shift keying or cpfsk for that we consider this data signal which is summation n i n g t minus n t where this i n can belong to some constellation let's say it is plus minus 1 plus minus 3 and so on and this g t is a signal which is 1 by 2 t then this v t we define a signal v t which is basically under root 2 e by t e power g this term and my signal s t is under root 2 e by t which is basically real part of this signal which is given by this formula here which is cos 2 pi fct plus phi t comma i plus phi naught and this phi t comma i is basically the phase which is given by theta uh, n plus 2 h i n q t minus t where this q t minus t is simply integral of this g q t is basically just integral of this signal over the capital t duration and this theta n is basically give, given by this and this <coughs> H is the modulation index.
and this qt as i mentioned is integration of this component so this is basically zero from t less than zero t by 2t for zero to capital t and half for t greater than t now the next thing is the continuous phase modulation so this is simple this is a simple extension of uh, this CPFSK or rather uh, instead of saying that uh, this CP CPFSK is generalization of the CPM for that we have this phi t comma i which is given by this formula again this HK is modulation index IK is the MRE information carrying signal this QT as I mentioned earlier is uh, integral of minus infinity to t g tau d tau and then there are various options like you can go for full response CPM or partial response CPM. So then uh, we looked at a special form of uh, binary CPFSK. In that what we did we set uh, the modulation index as half and this phi t comma i as theta n plus <coughs> pi by 2 i n t minus n t by t and <laughs> this theta n is given by pi by 2 summation k running from minus infinity to infinity i k so the signal that we will be transmitting will be basically s i t which is a cos pi uh, cos 2 pi f i t plus theta n pi by 2 n into minus 1 to the power i minus n where this f1 is given by fc minus 1 by 4 t the detailed derivation is there in the lectures and i don't think you will be asked those derivations but you can just scan through them once then f2 is fc plus 1 by 4t so the delta f here is 1 by 2t now if we go back here and see this 1 by 2t so if i'm modulating it with a 1d signal it is the minimum separation in frequency that is required and that's why this is known as minimum shift key after that we saw uh, qpsk and offset qpsk so uh, if we see, let's say this QPSK 000110 or rather, we have this QPSK. So if we have a QPSK, then the between two. Um, so yeah, okay. Let me draw it. It's, hey, I am having this, 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 this. S1, S2, S3 and S4. So if I am sending a QPSK then either I can send S1, S2, S3 or S4. So now suppose I sent S1 and then I sent S3. Then the frequent, the phase shift between these two signals is basically 90 plus 90 which is 180. Therefore the maximum phase difference that I can or phase deviation that I can encounter in a QPSK is of 180 degrees and that is a huge uh, frequency deviation. So in order to uh, reduce that frequency deviation we go for an offset QPSK. So what we will do is we will add an offset of uh, one symbol duration and that will just reduce my maximum phase deviation to 90 degrees which helps us a lot so this improves the phase continuity conditions or phase continuity in our case and that's why we generally go for offset QPSK than QPSK after that we went on to look at the spectral characteristics <coughs> so for that we considered this ST which is real part of VT into e power j 2 pi FCT again we knew that this fss tau is real part of uh, this phi ss of tau is real part of phi vv of tau into e power j 2 pi fct and this fss of f which is which is the psd of this st will be half of phi vv f minus fc plus phi vv minus f minus fc now this phi vv is periodic with uh, period capital t and uh, this average over time or time average if we do for over this t then it will give me 1 by t summation m running from minus infinity to infinity phi i i m into phi g g tau minus m t and this phi g g of tau is basically integral of minus infinity to infinity which is basically the correlation autocorrelation of this g t the pulse which we are using and the psd or the fourier transform of this averaged uh, autocorrelation function of this data signal 
और द लो पास इक्वेलेंट ऑफ दिस डेटा सिग्नल इज गिवन बाय वन बाई टी मॉट जी एफ स्क्वायर इंटू फाइव आई आई एफ एंड इस फाइव आई आई एफ इज बेसिकली फॉर योर सीरीज रिप्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ दिस फाइव आई आई एम विच इज समेशन एम रनिंग फ्रॉम माइनस इंफिनिटी टू इन्फिनिटी फाइव आई आई एम इंटू ई पावर माइनस जी टू फाइव एफ एम टी सो दीज क्वेश्चन ऑल्सो समटाइम्स मे बिकम लेंथी बट यू कैन जस्ट गो थ्रू द दिस कंसेप्ट इन वीक नाइन कोर्स वीक नाइन ट्यूटोरियल यू विल हैव गुड अमाउंट ऑफ क्वेश्चन दैट हैव that has covered this con uh, that have covered these concepts okay so these were all the things that were related to your modulation schemes so and uh, your uh, res uh, your transmitter design like you saw how you are generating your bit stream then you saw now we are modulating them and after modulation you just uh, transmit them so when you know all of these things the next thing that you should look at is how you will detect what you have been transmitting till now so that uh, lands up into the new uh, the new topic of optimum receiver design so for that for optimum receiver design the receiver that we will be considering is the additive fight caution uh, the channel that we will be considering initially will be your A W G N channel, which is your additive white uh, Gaussian noise channel. So in this, what happens is, let's say I am transmitting some signal. Let's say S M T. Now this gets added with a noise N T, and I receive R T. <coughs> so your R T will be simply S M T. Plus N T, and uh, the receiver that will be and this phi T this noise N is your A W G N channel. So what it says is your autocorrelation function will be N not by two delta tau, and your P S T will be N not by two. For all frequencies. So, what does your receiver have to do? So, what basically is happening is, let's say this is your receiver. This is your receiver block. Okay. <coughs> let's see. I'll, instead of writing S M, I'll just write. M dash and this is receiving R of T. So what it will do is, it will first do signal demodulation. After that, it will first do your signal demodulation. and after that it will do the detection and the signal demodulation will give me an r vector so what is that r vector <coughs> so basically your r of t is basically sm t plus nt and this smt smt i can write as summation smi into fit where i equal to 1 to capital n where n is the number of bases that we are having in similar way i can write this rt as summation i equal to 1 to n ri fit and these ris if i stack them let's say r1 to rn transpose then this is my r vector so the signal demodulation will basically give me this r vector so there are various ways to <coughs> do this thing so the first way is the naive approach that uh, that we should do the correlation receiver because we know that this smk are basically projection of this smt over fkt dt so similarly what we can do is we can find rk 
as projection of r of t into f k t t t. So this will give me S M K plus N K. Now again, this N K is the uh, component of noise on this F K. And another thing to note here is your noise won't be spanned by only the capital N basis which we are having. It spans over infinite dimensions, but we are only interested in the noise which affects the n dimensions because we had proved we had proven that this r k s are uncorrelated or this vector r is uncorrelated with all the components of noise which are outside the dimensions so this r k s basically form the sufficient statistics in order to go ahead with your with our decision process so now if we need to generate these r k s we have this correlation receiver so what it does is we are having this rt which we are receiving then what it will do is it will first modulate this with f1t and so on with uh, f capital nt After multiplying, we'll integrate it over 0 to t range. After integrating, we'll sample it. And this sampling happens at t equal to capital T. And this will give me R1 to capital Rn, uh, sorry, R capital N. And this will give me my R vector, which we'll give to the detector. This is the way we'll operate if we are going for correlation receiver. Another approach of doing the same thing is going for matched filters. So what we can do is we can pass this RT through n parallel uh, filter, uh, a filter bank of n uh, filters and this will be a parallel filter bank and the impulse response of each of this filter let's say kth filter is fk capital t minus t and then we need to sample it at t equal to capital t now this fil this thing uh, is known as a matched filter because this filter is matched to transmitted signals your transmitted signal is combination of this fk's that is <coughs> linear combination of these f keys that's why <coughs> yeah <coughs> yeah that's why your input uh, that's why your input is basically linear combination of your f keys and therefore your hk that is each of these filter n filters is matched with the basis vectors which con which basically span your signal space which we are working in now an important feature of this is it maximizes the signal to noise ratio so this filter maximizes the signal to noise ratio and after sampling at t equal to capital t it gives us the exactly same r vector which we have received in the correlation receiver so in matched filter what happens is we are having this r r signal that is the received signal then this passes through HKT or let me write it properly let's say F1 of capital T minus small t then let's see F2 capital T minus t and so on till Fn capital T minus t and after that we'll sample it we'll sample these at t equal to capital t so this will give us r1 r2 and rn so this is our r vector and this will send to detector so this is how we'll have our matched filter so now once we have uh, this r vector the next thing that we need to do is this detection process. We have the signal demodulation happened. We received our R vector. So it is now we need to design, uh, now in order to des design an optimum receiver, we need to design an optimal detection.
so the optimal detector that we are having is known as the maximum a posteriori probability detector that is max rule that is this is the optimum rule this minimizes your probability of error and uh, what this rule says is you decide in favor of that vector or that symbol which maximizes the a posteriori probability that is what that is after looking at my received vector r after looking at the received vector r which is the most likely signal that i had transmitted which basically means that which is the maximum which probability is the maximum or rather probability that sm given r is maximized by which m so this sm star is basically arc max over m equal to 1 to capital m p of sm given r or this is also equivalently written as arc max of p of r given sm into p of sm so this simply comes from your base rule i can write this I can write this as p of r given sm into p of sm upon p of r now th this r this p of r is independent of your maximization variable it is independent of your m so you can simply drop this p, uh, probability of r so what you are left with is probability r given sm or rather pdf of r given sm into p of sm now suppose this p of sm is equal to 1 by m for all m that is if you have equiprobable symbols then your max then you will land up in your maximum likelihood rule where it says that if this is independent of your small m then it this is only maximizing your likelihood function that is pmf or rather pdf of r given sm now this is known as your maximum likelihood function or maximum likelihood rule and this map rule is equal to your ml rule only when your sm are equiprobable now this ml rule gives you minimum distance detection uh, detector rule if your noise is gaussian this is not gen uh, true in general if you have some other kind of noises this is not true however if you are working with a gaussian noise scenario then yes your uh, ml rule is equivalent to your minimum distance detector rule which is given by this formula sm equal to norm or uh, norm square of r minus sm this is the distance so we are looking at the minimum distance or it is equivalent to c the arg max of this correlation function so this r dot sm is your correlation plus some energy term which we are having now if we have a binary pulse amplitude modulation scheme then this decision rule for my ml rule uh, reduces to r or rather if we are looking at a scenario where i am having two symbols s1 and s2 which where s1 is under root eb and s2 is minus eb which is something like this this is zero so the detection rule is um if my r the received vector the receive uh, point r is greater than this threshold then i'll decide in favor of s1 and if my r is less than this uh, threshold then i'll decide in favor of s2 okay and now when my uh, if these two signals are equiprobable that is your p equal to half then this logarithm goes to zero which means if this will be the threshold when p equal to 0.5 now if uh, p is greater than 0.5 that is probability that this signal is transmitted higher then then you should assign a higher decision region to <coughs> for this sm that is your threshold should lie here that is your threshold should be negative so if my p is greater than 0.5 then this 1 minus p upon p will be less than 1 and therefore this log of some value less than 1 will be a negative that's why your threshold will lie somewhere here so here threshold when p is less than 0.5 
and uh, similarly if my p is greater than 0.5 then the then <coughs> sorry p is greater than 0.5 yeah similarly if my p is less than 0.5 then this this quantity will be transmitted more which means that the decision region for this s2 should be higher that means i should assign this a uh, higher uh, or a larger decision region that's why my threshold will be greater than one so if p is greater than uh, p is gre less than 0.5 then this uh, 1 minus p upon p will be greater than one and that's why the threshold will be lie somewhere here this will be threshold when p is less than 0.5 Okay, <coughs> now if I am looking at the constellations with memory, then this machine, this maximum likelihood rule will be equivalent to the nearest sequence detector rule. So once we have these decision rules or uh, optimum detectors, the next thing that we should analyze is the performance of that system under the use of your optimum detector now in order to do that the best metric to do with the given situation is the probability of error and uh, for all the constellation schemes which we had seen we now look at the probability of error so the first uh, constellation scheme was this pulse amplitude modulation so for binary pulse amplitude modulation the probability of error is given by the formula q of under root 2 eb by n naught where this q function or rather q of x is 1 by under root 2 pi integral x to infinity <coughs> e power minus t square by 2 dt and this is basically the probability that x is greater than or equal to x for x distributed as normal 0 comma 1 so how to visualize it so this is your standard normal pdf with mean 0 and this is your x so this is the probability of x greater than or equal to x and this is also known as the tail probability <coughs> now if we go for uh, m or epam then the probability of error is 2 times m minus 1 by capital M q of 6 log m to the base 2 eb upon m square minus 1 times n naught. Now the important insight that we had seen was the probability of error for different values of m was something like this. So this was for m equal to 1, uh, sorry m equal to 2 m equal to 4 and m equal to 6 so this thing is m increases so we saw that for a given energy so for a given energy your probability of error p m increases with m so if this is ha having a higher m so it is having a higher probability of error similarly if we have for a given p m that is for a given value of uh, probability of error we need a higher energy eb compared uh, compared to your small value of m so as m increases for a given probability of error to achieve a given probability of error we require higher amount of energy so this is basically your eb and this is your pm let's say this is m equal to 16 this is m equal to 4 and this is m equal to after that we looked at the probability of error for m equal so we saw that uh, this is this we treated as equal to 2 pam of size under root m so uh, the probability of error for under root m sized uh, pam for amplitude modulation using this formula this formula reduces to this and this pm for this quam this is for quam rather m quam so this comes out to be 1 minus 1 minus p under root m square and we derived some uh, upper bounds on these probabilities <coughs> which is 4q 2e 
average upon m minus 1 and not or it is also less than m minus 1 q time q of under root t mean square upon 2 and not and the trends for the probability of error were exactly the same as we had observed in <coughs> observed for pulse amplitude modulation the next thing that we saw was the probability of error for MRE PSK. This was not uh, derived in detail, just mentioned. And we saw that uh, this is approximately equal to Q of under root 2 gamma s sin pi m, where this gamma s is symbol energy Es upon n naught. And the trends of probability of error were exactly the same as the trends that we had seen for the probability of error of pulse amplitude modulation. Sorry. <clears throat> After that, we looked at the probability of error for M orthogonal, MRE orthogonal signaling, or uh, specifically, we saw it for uh, FSK. So, for FSK, the probability of error uh, for MRE FSK, it was uh, obtained as one minus this big formula. You you don't need to remember it. It's fine. Then this PM is approximately equal to 2 times PB. If <coughs> uh, another side note, you don't need to re remember this formula, but you can just look at the derivation of how it was derived so that you should know how to handle the PMFs and condition and other things. Now, the insights that we had seen for this particular thing were like completely opposite than what we had seen for the previous constellation schemes. So we saw that for here, this was the plot for m equal to 16. Then this is for m equal to 4. And this is for m equal to 2. So this is the direction of my increasing m now. So what we saw that for given eb, for a given eb, the as your probability of error reduces as m increases similarly for a given value of pm we require less eb as m increases now in order to understand how this is happening what we do is we consider the union bound that is the probability of union of i equal to 1 to n ei is less than or equal to summation of i equal to 1 to n probability of ei it satisfies with equality when uh, eis are disjoint events so we're using this union bound we find the upper bound for this probability of error as e power minus k eb by n naught 2 minus log 2 by 2 and this tends to 0 as k tends to infinity provided this this factor here is greater than 0 that is eb by n naught is greater than 2 log 2 and it's a tighter bound for that that is for e b by n not less than 4 log 2 my probability of error will be less than 2 times e power minus k under root e b by n not minus under root log 2 so given these conditions we see that if uh, i am sending as my m increases which indicates that as my k increases my probability of error goes to 0 <coughs> for m array orthogonal signal but a trade-off here is as these are orthogonal signaling the bandwidth that i am consuming increases if i'm going for fsk the bandwidth i'm consuming increases with the number of uh, basis vectors i'm considering which means that i'm getting a, lo a very low i'm getting a low probability of error at a cost of higher bandwidth After looking at this probability of errors, the next thing that we wanted to look at was uh, channel capacity. And in order to do that, we looked at different channel models. One was this binary symmetric channel where I'm having zeros and one, zero, one uh, transmitted and zero, one being received. So either I can receive a zero or I can receive a one. So I can receive a zero with probability one minus P. And receive a 1 with probability p similarly one can be received as 0 with probability p and one can be received as 1 with probability 1 minus p the next thing is discrete input and continuous output channel so we are having discrete inputs at the 
transmitter end however at the receiver i can receive any uh, continuous value and that is characterized by the pdf of y given x equal to xk if i am having capital k values of uh, x's that i can transmit or k sized alphabet so this is exactly the same case that we have been analyzed till now and the next thing is we can have a continuous waveform channel so in continuous waveform we have continuous time waveforms at input and output however i can represent the uh, continuous waveform which we are transmitting as uh, the with the help of uh, the discrete coefficients uh, like we have this xt as x m k into f k t where k is ranging from 1 to capital N. So if I'm having this, it is sufficient to just look at this xm case. So if that is the case, then this, re this re uh, reduces to the equivalent discrete time channel. And this can be characterized by this particular waveform, uh, this particular PMF. So this indicates that this is a discrete time memoryless channel. Now why we are looking at these channels? Just to understand the concept of channel capacity. So this channel capacity is uh, based on the definition of mutual information. So the mutual information between two random variables x and y is given by this formula. So what is happening is I am transmitting x, it is getting through some channel, some noise is getting added, then I am having this y here which I am receiving. Now if that is the case then uh, what my aim is to understand what x was transmitted. So basically this y should tell me something about this x. So the mutual information that this y shares about x should be high enough so that I can decide what x was transmitted. So the channel capacity is max of the xj i of x comma y that is the mutual information and I need to maximize it over this pxj because these transition probabilities or this py given x these pyi given xj's pyi given xj's are specified by the channel so in order to maximize them the only thing that i have in my hand is this pxj this one this is not why this is x yeah <coughs> the pxj so in order to maximize it i should be able to choose the probability distribution of my input that will maximize the channel capacity the class then the next thing is the classical shannon capacity formula which is c uh, which is given by w log 1 plus p average by w n naught after looking at these things we then went on to look at the communication through band limited channels first we looked at the ideal channel and then we went ahead and looked at uh, non ideal channels so for ideal channels what we have is the frequency domain or the Fourier transform of this ideal channel is flat over this particular bandwidth and uh, this theta f that is phase is linear. Now in our, uh, if that is the case then the ct is sync to wt where the sync x is defined by sine pi x by pi x. Now in order to avoid ISI so how is it is happening is you have this sync function here. Okay, now this is a null. So I, what I'll do is I'll send uh, another signal at the nulls, something like this. So that's why if I'm sampling at this duration, if I'm sampling here, then all the other signals are zero. Only the that particular signal instant, whatever I had transmitted, that particular signal will be non-zero. So in order to avoid ISI, I'll send uh, the symbols at the integer multiple of which is 1 by 2w this filter this filter this ct sync to 5, 2wt is given as uh, is known as the Nyquist filter and the symbol rate that it gives is 2w now in general any Nyquist filter or pulse we can obtain by having convolution with a rectangular pulse in frequency domain or multiplication with the sync in time domain so if i multiply any signal with uh, this sync function then you can see that the nulls that i am having will still persist now the issue with these nyquist filters are it has an infinite teal so it is a non-realizable thing and if we have a small synchronization error then there will be a significantly large isi for example instead of sampling here if i sample here then i'll encounter large isi from all the past symbols that i had transmitted so in order to design a 
pulse the important two points that we need to take into consideration are we should have lower tail amplitudes that is a faster decay and we should have zeros at the sampling time so that can be done by considering raised cosine which is given by the formula mentioned here for this we have this absolute bandwidth as w and w naught as 1 by 2 t which is the max maximum Nyquist bandwidth rate and we are basically extending it till your w which is something like this so this is your w naught this is w this is your minus w naught this is your w and this additional thing that we are having is this w minus w naught this is some additional factor and uh, it can be characterized by the low role of factor which is w minus w naught upon w and this this particular function has its time domain representation as something like this and this w this w is given by the formula 1 by 2 1 plus r into rs where rs is the symbol rate <laughs> now what we are getting here is we are having zeros at the sampling duration because of this sink and this tails fall off at a rate of w square inverse so this is 1 by w square kind of thing so the tails fall inversely pro uh, tails fall directly proportional to w square however it is still a non causal filter now, in order to get the end to end channel as raised cosine, what we can do is we can have a, a root raised cosine filter at transmitter and root raised cosine filter at receiver. The together they would give me a <coughs> root raised cosine filter. Uh, sorry, raised cosine end to end. The next thing that we can do is now, uh, okay, this is a non realizable. However, let's uh, in order, uh, another thing is this symbol rate is 2w upon 1 plus r and if this r is uh, greater than 0 then uh, my symbol rate will reduce so in order to have the same symbol rate what we can do is we can introduce we can use some controlled isi like have isi at one or two play one or two sorry two or three sampling durations and then um, transmit it so that can be done by duo binary signals and modified duo binary signals which are given by these two and a general class of band limited signals is given by the formula xt equal to summation n x of n by 2w sync of 2 by w t plus 2 by sorry this is n n by 2w and the Fourier transform of this is x of f equal to 1 upon 2w summation n x of n by 2w into e power minus j by n uh, f by f so these are having controlled isi so we in this generalized thing we can set uh, we can set uh, the values of n and then uh, get either duo binary or modified duo binary signals or we can uh, go ahead and uh, design another other class of filters or other class of signals now the next thing that we had seen was this detection of duo binary signals so this ym is equal to bm plus nu m this bm is what we are transmitting now again we are ha for this duo binary we had uh, one at n equal to zero and one so this bm is im plus im minus one and uh, we have so this should be yeah okay fine then we have uh, pre-coding a transmitter which is done by this formula here so this this symbol is basically modulo m uh, difference and pm equal to 2 times pm plus pm minus 1 minus m minus 1 this is again modulo and okay and this dm is half of bm plus 1 so this is modulo m addition and in similar way we can have the detection for modified do binary signals so we have im equal to 2 pm minus m minus 1 and pm equal to dm XOR with or rather modulo m addition with pm minus 2 and this dm is equal to half of <coughs> pm so after that we, were, we saw the non-ideal channels so in ideal channel we had uh, flat response in that in that particular bandwidth however in non-ideal channels we don't have the linear phase and flat condition so for that we require the estimation we require uh, equalization which will have some part of uh, estimation of channel or detection and followed by filtering and the very basic thing of having these kind of things is this zero forcing equalization that so which is given by h equivalent of f equal to one upon uh, h channel 
of f which is again written as 1 upon h magnitude of hch of f into e power minus j times angle of hch of f okay so this we have and uh, after that we looked at the channel equalization and we saw that this channel equalization needs the channel estimation that and that can be either data aided or non data aided we majorly looked at this non data uh, sorry this data aided scheme so for that we have this linear transversal filter like if we have z equal to xc then ideally we can have the c as x inverse of z but if it is not an invertible thing then we have to look at pseudo inverses for example if we have y equal to hx plus w then I can estimate this h as y into pseudo inverse of x and I can estimate this x as pseudo inverse of h into y and this kind of approach is known as the least square approach. Another popular approach is for doing the same thing is this Wiener filter, Yule -Walk equa Walker equations, Wiener Hopf equations and other things. Then we saw that, uh, then we saw the mean square criteria. So it says that we'll have the minimum mean square error when my error is orthogonal to the data. And based on this ideology, we have this LMMSC that is linear minimum mean square error estimation. So if we have y equal to h theta plus w, then the estimate of this theta will be given by this formula. And if we are not able to get some closed forms, the uh, one way to do the same things is go for the steepest descent. So that is an iterative approach which in which the n plus oneth update is given by the nth update plus half of mu times delta jw where this gradient of jw where this uh, jw is basically the cost function which we want to minimize and this mu is the step size. Then we looked at uh, kramer rao bound. So for this kramer rao bound to exist, we need to look at the regularity condition that is the differentiation of, of uh, this likelihood function or log likelihood function with respect to the parameter that need to be estimated should be equal to zero. If that is true, then the minim, uh, MSC that is min squared error will be greater than or equal to one upon i theta where this i theta is the Fisher information matrix which is given by minus of expectation of second derivative of your log likelihood function. And if in case I'm able to write this differentiation of log likelihood function as i theta into g y minus theta, then this g of y is basically the estimate, an unbiased estimate or minimum variance unbiased estimate of theta. And this estimate will achieve my kramer rao bound with equality and hence such an estimate is known as my efficient estimate. After that, we looked at the ML estimation. So this ML estimation is given by theta hat equal to arc max of theta f of y given theta. And this theta hat asymptotically achieves, uh, asymptotically is Gaussian with theta comma i theta inverse. And uh, if we are, if we need to go for this phase estimation, then it is given by this formula. That is phi hat equal to minus tan inverse of for these two ratios where this wn is Gaussian for all n. So all of these things we had seen to look at the carrier and phase synchronization. So now this carrier and phase synchronization have uh, has to be done because uh, your transmitter and receivers have local oscillators. So these may generate slightly different frequencies and there would be slightly different phases also. So in order to, and since we are doing a demodulation at the receiver end, we should have exact things uh, like exact the carrier which was generated at the transmitter. So in order to have that, uh, we need to know the knowledge of these frequencies and phase errors that can be done uh, or rather we need to estimate them and compensate for them at the receiver end. And that can be done through PLL like phase loop, phase like uh, phase lock loop or this decision directed or squaring loop or four stars too. The next important thing here is uh, clock synchronization. So again, we are uh, sending our signals for a fixed clock durations and that's why we should know the value of your symbol duration. And also there should, there will be some delay by which we are receiving. So we should have the knowledge of this T and uh, delay at the receiver end. So one option is we can have a master clock at transmitter and receiver that is shared by them or the transmitter should send the clock information 
or the receiver should extract the clock information from the receiver data. So in this third option that is estimating this clock and delay, uh, we can go for ML rule or early late gate synchronization rule. So these are the important concepts that uh, need estimation and detection. And uh, this was all that was covered in this entire course, which I have summarized today in the span of today's tutorial. This was I, all I wanted to cover today. If you have any doubts, please let me know. Otherwise, you are free to leave the meeting. Thank you for attending today's session.